God. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As the blissful aroma of God's word fills this sanctuary and saturates our souls, let us prepare for the preaching of God's word through prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you are the source of all light. You divinely separate light from darkness so that we may have the beauty of the light of day. Illuminate, enlighten, and lead us to know you through your word. Humble our souls to receive it as you exalt us at this time together with you, Lord God. We pray this in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Hey, a few weeks ago, I was, uh, I was at home. I was playing with my youngest granddaughter, Brooke, Brookie, as we call her. Brookie's a year and a half. She's not two. She's about a year and a half. Now, we were playing uh, with, uh, with the balloon. We were just playing catch. I was playing catch with her. And I was, as I was playing catch with her, she, she's not able to catch everything. So the, ball kind of, the balloon kind of wanders off. And so she runs and gets it, and then she throws it back, and we keep playing. Well, as we were playing this game, uh, I noticed something unusual that was going on as she was going to retrieve the balloon, something very unusual that caught my attention. What would happen sometimes when I would throw her the balloon and it went off, uh, when she ran to get the balloon to go pick it up, she would look up at the like the, the wall, the upper part of the wall, the ceiling. And she would be looking up, like trying to get the balloon. She'd be looking up, and she would kind of moan, kind of go, ooh, like that. It was, it was, it was fascinating. But, you know, I thought it was a one-time thing. So, so I noticed that she wouldn't get the balloon. She would just leave it there. She would just get up and walk away come back to me. And so I would go get the balloon and then I would do it again. And then sure enough, she would go get the balloon, but she would look up and then stop and go back. And she would, she'd leave the balloon there. I had to go get it. Now I mentioned that to Christy, her mom, <laughs> who had noticed something very similar. And, and so we started talking about it. She finally understood what was going on. And she told me what was happening. She said that, what Brooke was seeing were, were shadows. Like when the ball, the, the balloon would go to, to the wall next to the window, the curtain that's on the window would block off the sunlight. Well, the sunlight would bounce up and go up the curtain into the top of the wall. You could see the sunlight and it would hit the first part of the ceiling and you would see it. And because there's a tree there, the leaves on the tree would sometimes, when the, when the sunlight was coming in, would, you would see reflections. That's what she was watching. That's what she was seeing. Now listen, I, hey, what good would it do me? And, we, and I did. I said, hey, Brookie, Brookie, that's just a, that's just a shadow. Brooke has no concept of a shadow. I mean, we could try to, I could try to explain it to her, but that, that is meaningless to her. It, it does not make any sense at all. What, I, what was going on and what was real and serious to her was what she was seeing. She was keenly watching this, and it changed her behavior to the point where she just left that balloon there and came back. She would leave it there, and she would come back. What is, what is interesting is the way she would look, the way, the way she would act. She was being very mindful of the shadow being there. And she was being watchful as she neared the balloon, couldn't get close enough, so just leave it there. Very mindful of what was there and watchful as she approached it. And so it is with us. So it is with sin in our lives. After a while, see, that shadow doesn't bother me. I, I just ignore it. I mean, I, I don't really pay attention to it anymore. Isn't that the way it is with sin in our lives? It is something that's there. I don't notice it anymore. 
We don't notice it anymore. But Rookie, she's seen that. And that's what our sermon's about. That's what Peter is telling us in our sermon. This morning, we're concluding our sermon series on the first epistle of St. Peter called Stand Fast in Christ. The Apostle Peter has written this letter to the Christians of, of his time who are undergoing and suffering persecution because God's word is a living word. He's also writing to us. It is applicable to us as well. As Peter closes out his letter, he is calling us to be humble and submissive under the mighty hand, the immense power of God himself. He is telling us to be humble and submissive under the immense power of God. Ah, but somebody will say, you know, Manny, that's what he's calling us to do. But look, being humble, being humility is a weakness in this world. When you're humble, when you're when you have humility, that is viewed as a weakness in this world. And you know what? You're right. It is. But not in the eyes of the Lord, not in the eyes of our God. But somebody else may say, hey, Manny, I am a true believer. I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not afraid of nothing. Fear not. Well, that's true, too. But that's not what Peter's talking about. He's saying be humble, not prideful, but be sober-minded. Be watchful, be vigilant against something that we cannot see or may not see or started to ignore all the while, something that does not make sense. Like little Brookie, that shadow does not make sense in her mind. That, and isn't that the way the mind works? Our minds work when it comes in regard to our eyes and seeing things. Our minds try and will make sense of what it's looking at. That's the way our mind works. That's why when we see something, our mind is working to make sense of it. Well, Brookie, for the, for, perhaps for the first time, has noticed a shadow, and her mind is trying to make sense of it. See, that's where the prophets of the Old Testament, when they would try to talk about something they saw in heaven, heavenly things, they couldn't describe it. Oh, it's got a bunch of wheels. It's a wheel. It's got a bunch of eyes around it. It's twirling this way and that. And they're trying to describe the indescribable. Their mind is trying to make sense of something that does not make sense to them. That's sin. It doesn't make sense. And Peter is saying, be humble to the power of the Lord. Be sober-minded and watchful because there are things that are going on that don't make sense. These are, the, these are the wiles and the scheme of who? The devil. Satan himself. They go on all the time. These schemes, these wiles of the devil, the adversary are constantly trying. I mean, it talks about it the, like, like a roaring lion looking, looking at whom he can devour. That's nonstop. Now, if you don't believe that, you should have been at the session meeting we had the other day. We had a session meeting the other day. And, and mind you, we, we, we set, try to saturate ourselves with prayer because God is leading this church and we are submissive to him. But at a moment when we get prideful, guess who wants to pound on us, even in a session meeting, even in a meeting for this church? If we allow pride to enter, he will pound on it. He will try to destroy us, separate us, and destroy this church. There is no one that I love more than my brothers in, this, in, in the session, in this church leadership. No one that I love more than them. But I cannot be prideful. I, but I must be submissive to whose church is it? It's God's church. It's Christ's church. The minute pride comes into play, I'm, we're under attack. Praise the Lord, we stopped to pray, and, and things went on, and we, we ended up on a high note. You would be happy to know. But see, that's not just for church leadership and sessions. That is for every one of us, especially marriages. Marriages, think about that. Who do you love the most? Spouse. You love them, you love them the, 
with everything. You love your spouse the most. But the minute, the minute you allow your guard down and you're not humble to being, doing what it's telling us to do, to be what? Mindful, soberly mindful, and vigilant, watchful, you'll be attacked. Your marriage could come in jeopardy. It could be in jeopardy. It is always happening. It is around us. It can occur to any of us. We must not take it for granted. But we rejoice. We rejoice because through humility, the God of all grace calls us into his eternal glory in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God is watching over us. And when we get prideful, he reminds us. He reminds us. He reminds us. Because Satan is right there trying to pounce. And sometimes he'll let him pounce to remind us. When we look at our passage, it is easy to break it down into three parts. Those parts are accepting difficult times. I don't want to hear that, Manny. I don't want to hear about accepting difficult times, but that's what he's talking about. The second part is standing fast against the devil. See, we stand fast in Christ against the devil. And the third part is trusting God to put things right. God will put all things right. So as you start looking at our passage in verses 6 through 8, we look at accept the reality of, of accepting difficult times, hardship, struggles in our lives because they come from where? Who allows them to happen? Who allows them? God allows them. God allows them to happen. Now, we know that God is not the author of sin. God does not sin. We also know that God is sovereign in everything he does. So in his providence, God can and does use hardships, difficult times, to shape, guide, and build us in this process that we call, we've talked about before, sanctification, being made holy. You are being made holy. We are being made holy every day of our lives. Sometimes we stumble, but we are being made holy. You remember the story of Job? Old Testament story of Job. Job was said to be a righteous man compared to all of us. Righteous. But not on the, stand, not on the standards of the heavenly plane. But anyway, he was a righteous man. So in the, but he's going, he's on this earth, so he's going through this process of being made holy. So in this process of sanctification, the Lord allows Job to be attacked by Satan, the Satan, the devil himself. The devil himself attacks, torments, and inflicts. He inflicts some horrible things to Job. Horrible. It would break all of us. But after this season, season of torment, God restores Job twofold. Restores everything twofold back to him. Peter, in our text, talks about three, what we call imperatives, three commands that are being presented to us that we need to adhere to. And the first one is be humble. Be humble. Be submissive. Submit to God. Submit to God at His authority. Now, that can be extremely painful, extremely difficult. Again, because when bad things happen, when we go through hardships, we realize that it's certainly not from, I mean, it's not God causing this. I mean, the hardship or, or, or part of this world, but God knows and he's allowing it. He's allowing it to happen. And we have to be humble. He's humbling us, certainly humbling. Boy, if you, for, guys, if, this is why sometimes we say, hey, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And, and we talk about, I'm not afraid of God. I mean, I love him. He could take me right now. I, I love him. My, there's no one else I love more than Christ. No one. But is there a reverence there? Yeah, there's a reverence, a respect, even a fear, even a fear. Not that I'll lose my salvation, but of things that could happen. 
if I don't continually submit and be humbled by him. That's why at the session meeting, we all like, hey, we got to stop. We, we, we got out of hand. Let's, we got a little loud. Let's repent and let's pray. I mean, that's the way it works. So it, we're, ta- we, we, we're talking about being never forgetting to be humble because God is in charge of all things. He's the power. He's the mighty God. He's powerful. He's, he, he's, uh, he's over all things. So when we're going through a difficult season, we must trust God. We must trust him. We're praying to him. We're asking him for grace to help us through it. And we have to trust him that he's going to get us through it. We can't see that. We can't see beyond right here. And sometimes it, it looks like it, we're never going to make it, man. I ain't going to make this. We got to trust him. We got to trust him. Even when loved ones die, we have to trust him. We have to trust in him. Do we want to see that? Of course not. But we have to trust in the Lord. But sometimes we get stubborn, right? Sometimes we get stubborn. Like, I don't want that to happen. Or I'm here where I want to be. I'm not going to do what you say. I'm just going to stay here. Stubborn. We get stubborn. And we, and we, and we, oh, we make excuses for why we're stubborn. We, in fact, we start thinking of ways that what we're doing is okay. It's not a sin. It's not against God. We're, hey, we got an intelligence here. We come up with creative ways. So what does God do when we get, become stubborn and we're, we're set right there? We're no longer growing spiritually. What does God do? The tests keep coming, man. But even worse than that, he's going to turn you over to what you want. Go ahead. Go ahead. The prodigal son. You're not losing your salvation, but you're going to feel it. He turns you over to your sinfulness. And that's when you come back. Well, God will give us over to our sinfulness. We'll continue to have seasons of difficulties. And we will be, we'll continue to be attacked by Satan himself, or his minion, his minion. So that brings us to the second imperative, the second command that Peter's talking about. He's telling us to be clear and sober-minded, sober-minded. In other words, stay focused on what's going on. Stay focused on God's truth. And if you do that... God will bring you around. God will make you strong, firm, and steadfast in his love. But he's going to put you through trials. And we have to stay focused, sober-minded. What does the word sober mean? Now, everybody, when they, you hear sober, what are you thinking about? A drunk, right? A drunk. A guy's drunk. That means he's not sober. His faculties have been impaired. And we think maybe that's a falling down drunk, and we know that's, you know, legally you don't have to be falling down drunk to be arrested. But anyway, sober-minded literally means free of intoxicating influences. You must, we must be free of intoxicating influences. And what does that mean? We have to guard against idols in our lives, whether that be alcohol, drugs, sex, money. Anything else that will intoxicate us and get our attention. To be sober means to allow ourselves to be influenced on anything that will lead us away from God's truth. To be sober-minded means you have to stay focused. To be intoxicated means you're going to you're, that you're gonna you're focused on something that leads us away from God's truth. Anything that leads us away from God's truth is what? Sin. Yeah, here's the sin. Not good. Not good. And if you belong to him, it's not good. Something's going to happen. He's going to bring you back to him. Because he loves us. See, it's all about love. It's all about how God loves us. God, God's not going to love us and then let us go into the filth of sin. He's going to love us and bring us to him. God will bring to completion what he has started in you. Justification. He has saved you. He's going to bring to completion all your life what he has already started in you. The whole process. Some of us get stuck. Some of us stumble. 
we repent, and we get up, and we keep going because we believe faith, and we have faith in the Lord. So the third imperative now he talks about is, is to be watchful, sober-minded and watchful, vigilant. That was one of the DPS policies. Uh, highway patrolman will be vigilant when he's out there patrolling. Going, vigilant, man, that sounds pretty good. I wonder what that means. Watchful. It means watchful. Be looking for the things that you're supposed to be patrolling, that you're supposed to be enforcing. Well, for us, we got to be vigilant. Vigilance requires action on our part. It requires act. Sanctification requires action on our part. Sanctification is done by the power of the Holy Spirit who will bring to completion what he has started in you. Amen. But you're involved. You're involved. You're involved. Because if you say no, if you resist, you're involved. But if you, if, if you submit and you're humble, you'll be strengthened. You're, you will grow in your spiritual growth. Be watchful, be vigilant. So we, we must be clear-minded. We must be vigilant to what is going on in our lives and what's going on around us in the world. And see, that's where you pray, you stay God's word. Be mindful. Don't take your spouse for granted. Don't take where God has, has you serving for granted. Don't take nothing for granted. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Things that you don't understand are attacking you. Jesus himself calls us to be sober-minded and vigilant. Watchful. In Mark chapter, uh, the Gospel of St. Mark chapter 14, in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus commands that we are to watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Then he tells us this, and then he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's you and me. Our spirit, we belong to Christ. We're, we want to we wanna obey. We, we want to be, we want to do it. But our flesh is weak. That's why we, 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 we get all our, our mind, soul, and flesh are involved in this process of sanctification. We have to be sober-minded and watchful. That brings us to our next point in verses 8 and 9. We must stand fast in Christ against the devil. The devil. And that can only be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit to be walking with the Lord. God is walking, nurturing you, and he's with you. And we stumble, we run into this crisis, and we call out to him for grace to help us through it. And we may even say, please take it away from us. And he may or may not, but he will help us through it. He will walk through the fire with us to get us through it. So we are to stand fast in Christ against the devil. This involves, again, action, action on our part. This action of spiritual growth in the sanctification process. Why? Well, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, devour, destroy, to rip apart. Devour, to rip apart. He wants to destroy you. He wants to. He didn't. He could care less that you say you belong to Christ. He wants to rip you apart, destroy you and your family. And see, the, the amazing thing is when Peter's saying this, when he's writing this, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He knows the Satan is trying to destroy him and rip him apart. Why? Well, you remember the story. You remember the time in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, when Jesus tells Peter and the apostles, he says this to them. Get this. Jesus tells them, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Sift, sifted, sift you like wheat. The horror of that attack. Can you imagine Peter and the other disciples being told by Jesus that Satan, hey, Satan has asked permission to sift you, to sift you like wheat, to rip you apart. Ah, but I have prayed for you. 
You know the process of sifting wheat? I mean, it involves a sifter, obviously, like a mesh or something, and you put the, you put the wheat on top of it, and you kind of shake it around and sift it, and the grain, good, the pure grain falls through it, and the, and, and the, the stems and everything else is on top, and you throw that away, throw it into the fire. Can you imagine Satan trying to sift you like that? That's what he's trying to do. Those are the attacks that are continuous. And that's why we walk with Christ. That's why we walk with the Lord. But, but it's even more than that. We have to know things because we're told to resist them. How, can, how in the world can we resist that? Well, he's telling us to resist them. And, and you do it to, to, to Christ. You stand firm in Christ. You stand firm by the word of God, by his truth. You don't buy into the deception, the deception of the world. You don't say, well, that's okay. That part of the world is okay, even though it's, you know, God couldn't really kind of doesn't like it. It's okay. And that other part's terrible. You don't buy into any of the deception. Why? Well, because Satan's favorite weapon against you, against us, is what? Deception. Deception. He deceived Adam and Eve. He's deceived the world. He will deceive you and me. He works. He's smarter than us. So where do we go? We go to God. We trust in Him. We bury ourselves in His Word. We come and worship Him. We pray. We, we're, in, we're in a perpetual prayer, praying without ceasing. We must resist Him, standing firm in Christ. We are commanded to resist Him. So what does that mean? Commanded to resist Him? Okay, you got a temptation. And that temptation is very appealing to you. Very appealing. Whatever it might be, whatever it might be, it's appealing to you. And you're going, God, can you look away for just a minute? Maybe for a season? Very appealing. You're commanded to resist. Resist it. And you go, Lord, I can't resist it. I, I can't help it. I, I, I want to drink or, or I want pornography, whatever it might be. You ask him for grace. You pray for grace. And you have to be active. You have to resist. You have to get yourself out of that situation. Run. Run. Run from evil. Run. Turn and take off running. Repenting every, every step of the way. That's how you resist. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. You ask for grace. You tell him, I can't handle this. This is beyond me. This has defeated me in the past. I can't do it without your help. I need your grace. And then turn and run. Run. Paul talks about uh, doing something else that we have to do. We have to put on the full armor of God. The full armor of God spoken about in Ephesians chapter 6. It's, Paul says this. He says, Our struggle is not against flesh and, and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in a heavenly realm. When was the last time you fought something in heaven? I hadn't done it. They're usually down here, but they're down here. We must put on the full armor of God. All right, so when we look at our passage, what do we need to hear? What do we need to know? Well, we need to hear, we need to know what it says in verses 10 and 11. We must trust God. Trust God to put all things, to make all things right, okay? Your trust in God initially may not look like everything's going to be right, but it will be. It will be. You're battling these demonic forces, and you're saying, I'm trusting you to help me, to protect me, to guide me, to lead me. And you think, well, those are mere words. But you're praying to God, and you're taking action against it. And, and you're even saying, I can't, I want to actually do it, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to, I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to humble myself to you. And you turn away. And what does God do? What does God do? The God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you in the kingdom of God. Amazing. Amazing. 
This is some powerful stuff that Peter is talking about and some supernatural stuff that's going on. You remember the story of malaria, the, the, the disease malaria? You remember when it came out? Must be some of you remember. It is a deadly disease. Still around. Still around today. In fact, uh, just quick, in, in, in 2019, uh, an estimated 229 million cases of malaria were found worldwide. With a, uh, up to this point, uh, an estimated 400,000 400, in 2019 were killed from the disease malaria. But great medical advances were made against malaria. Researchers did not discover a cure for malaria. They, were, now they, they treat the symptoms, but they didn't discover a cure. But great medical advances were done to help. And what were those? Well, they discovered how the disease was spread. It was a parasite in a mosquito. Parasite in a mosquito. And a lot of it happened in tropical islands and stuff like that, our military. But so they discovered how malaria was spread through a parasite, through a mosquito. So what did they do? They attacked the problem. They attacked the mosquito. They, they went and they drained swamps. They, 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 uh, they sprayed pesticide wherever mosquitoes were at. Do y'all remember that? I don't know if you're old enough. Uh, the, the mosquito sprayer would go past, in, in our subdivisions, they would go driving past. It was this guy driving a truck, and he would be spraying uh, pesticide to kill mosquitoes. And it looked like a fog. So what did some kids do? We would run into that fog and play like it, we were playing. Sandy did that. Don't tell her she's not here. But anyway, I don't know if you remember that. That's what they were doing. They were, they were spraying for malaria. So they were able to drop the numbers. They were at least able to get it under control. It, it is far less, of, uh, malaria is far less impacting the world as it used to. What is Peter doing? Peter is, is, is doing the same thing. He is getting to the root of the problem. He is getting to the root of the problem. And instead of demonizing the people that are being used by the root of the problem, Satan, deception, he's saying guard against Satan. He's saying be on the lookout. Satan's going to be used by people. People you know are going to, Satan's going to use them to try to destroy you and other means. That's why he's saying humble yourself to trusting God to submitting to God, and then be what? Sober-minded that it could happen. Yeah, you're not exempt from nothing, okay? God could allow something to happen and be watchful, just like baby Brookie was watchful. There's something that I didn't even, <laughs> wasn't even thinking about. Well, sin is something you have to think about. It, it goes on all the time. It is a trying to, it, it's trying to attack us right now. His minion are sitting in here right now. They don't like what they're hearing, and they want you to distort it. But we rejoice. We stand firm in Christ. We trust and believe in Him. Through the abundance of His never-ending love, He's going to bless you abundantly for all times, starting on this side of the kingdom of God and going through the rest of eternity. Through humility, the God of all grace, cause us into his eternal glory in Jesus Christ our Lord. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray.